It's really unfortunate that no matter how much our technology advances, humanity basically remains the same. Greed, selfishness, and desire have always been and always will be a part of human nature, no matter how scientifically advanced we become as a species. I considered this as I thought about the events of the last two weeks events which changed my marriage and my entire life. Just two weeks ago, my wife Karis and I were on board the faster-than-light interstellar passenger liner Roddenberry as it entered our home system on its voyage from Earth to Pacifica. We had been together exclusively for seven years with five years as husband and wife and decided to take a vacation from Earth, still struggling to rebound after the Great Nuclear War of 2510, a devastating conflict that lasted only 90 minutes but managed to harm over a billion people. The war had been over for 50 years, but the wounds were still present. Karis and I were part of the effort to stabilize and rebuild what was left of the information infrastructure, which included what people in the 21st century called the Internet. We had been there for three years and decided it was time to take a break. So we headed home for what I thought would be a long vacation filled with sun and fun. As I looked out the window in our small room, Karis said she was going to the communications area to make a call to our families, letting them know we would be home soon. I nodded my head to show my agreement and kept looking out the small window, hoping to catch a glimpse of our home planet. She returned a half hour later, having made her calls, and came up behind me, looking over my shoulder at the darkness outside. We're still too far out to see home, dear, she said. Maybe in an hour or so, we'll spot it. Don't worry, we'll be home soon enough. Karis laughed and pushed me away. Dream on, buddy. We both turned back and looked out the window, hoping to be the first to spot our home world. Finally, we saw a tiny blue dot and knew we were getting close. Pacifica, settled over 300 years ago after some 75 years of surveys, was considered to be one of the first successful human colonies outside the solar system. Like Earth, Pacifica had its share of dangers in the form of poisonous plants, wild animals, and flesh-eating fish, but the people in charge decided the dangers were no worse than what humans had faced on Earth for ages. In fact, the benefits significantly outweighed the dangers. The ocean, which covered over 85% of the planet's surface, contained almost everything a human colony would need in terms of food, and water purification units easily converted the salty water into something fit for human consumption. Better yet, the delicious treats that came from the sea proved to be quite beneficial for the people who live on the planet. The same applied to the edible plants and fruits that were quite abundant. As a result, colonists found they lived much longer and healthier lives than they would have on Earth. Researchers suggested that a person born on Pacifica could, in theory, live to be 150 years old if their entire diet consisted of local food. It also helped that the environment was free of the chemical and radioactive waste that polluted and harmed Earth. Being healthier and more active meant that native Pacificans tended to be more physically active than their people on Earth counterparts, and for a considerably longer period of time. While people on Earth were entering menopause, native Pacificans were just reaching their physical peak, and Pacifican men were still fathering children well into their 70s. The founders also wanted to avoid the mistakes that led to Earth's ultimate downfall. By the time the colony was officially established, the crime rate on Earth had hit an all-time high. Gangs of armed thugs roamed the streets of the planet's cities taking whatever they wanted food, money, possessions, you name it with no repercussions. Illegal substances were sold over the counter to anyone with a few coins to spare regardless of age, and the planet's sense of morality had all but disappeared. As a result, over 95% of marriages in the so-called civilized nations of Earth ended in divorce, with infidelity being the cause for more than 80% of them. So the founders, perhaps fueled by a false sense of righteous anger, set up a tough system of justice that was swift and at times brutal, and to some, unfair. Infidelity, for example, was made a serious crime with severe penalties. But as imperfect as it was, the system seemed to work, and the crime rate on Pacifica was quite low, less than 10% that of Earth. So while Earth continued its descent into chaos, crime, and endless war, Pacifica thrived. Then the last great nuclear war happened, plunging much of the planet into something that resembled the Stone Age. Almost all of the great cities of Earth were completely destroyed, and all of the planet's power grids were destroyed, rendered inoperable by an electromagnetic pulse. Many of the remaining inhabitants lived in terrible conditions, fighting each other for a gallon of fuel or a stalk of green vegetables. It took 30 years for the radiation levels to drop enough for off-world teams to begin the task of rebuilding the planet's infrastructure. And for the last three years, Karis and I were part of that effort. It was difficult, to say the least. 
The hours were long, and the work could be physically demanding. Food and medicine had to be brought in, and security for the teams was tight. Native people had forgotten what it meant to live in a civilized society and would literally kill for a tiny piece of bread or fish. After three years of that, Karis and I decided we had to come home just to maintain our sanity and reconnect. Finally, the Roddenberry, named after a man who created an ancient but still popular science fiction program, docked at Pacifica Station, an orbital platform that served as a port of entry for the planet. The intercom came to life announcing our arrival, along with instructions for leaving the ship. Finally, home at last, I said, looking at Karis. She seemed lost in thought and didn't say anything for a few seconds. Yeah. Finally, she said quietly. Are you okay? I asked, concerned. I'm fine, she said in a neutral tone of voice. I didn't quite believe her, though. I would have thought she'd be happy to be home. Something was on her mind, but I couldn't figure it out, and she apparently didn't feel like talking. We left the ship, grabbed our bags, and headed for the shuttle that would take us to the planet below. After going through customs and the required medical screening, we walked into the main terminal and headed for the exit. My wife said nothing to me the whole time and barely acknowledged my presence. She suddenly stopped and turned to face me. She didn't look happy at all. I'm sorry, Jer, she said. What? What are you sorry for, Karis? I don't understand. I saw her look away, and I sensed the presence of two other men next to me. I looked and saw they were Pacifica security police officers. What was going on? Jer Kondrake, one of them asked. Yes, I answered. What can I do for you? You're under arrest, sir, the officer said. Please drop your luggage and place your hands behind your back. What am I being arrested for? I asked. I haven't done anything wrong. Infidelity, the other officer said. To be precise, multiple counts of first-degree serial infidelity. I looked at my wife, who was observing everything. Karis, what is this? I asked. I've never cheated on you, ever. You know that. Why are you doing this to me? She took a deep breath before answering. Like I said, Jer, I'm sorry, she said, refusing to look me in the eye. Can you at least call my lawyer? I asked. These charges are false. I've already called your father. He's contacting a lawyer. I think it would be best if we said goodbye here, she said before turning around and walking away. My mind was in chaos. What was happening, I wondered. I've never even considered cheating on Karis, even before we decided to be exclusive. I loved her more than anything and was looking forward to spending my life with her. The officers read me my rights and escorted me out of the terminal. I felt ashamed as the eyes of everyone in the terminal were on me. Someone being let off in restraints by police was a rare sight on Pacifica. I was placed in the back of the police cruiser and taken to jail where I was processed and deposited in a clean but tiny 8 foot by 8 foot square room with a single bar light, a bunk, and an information screen built into the wall. An hour later, I was taken from my cell and placed in a reception room where my father was waiting for me. What the heck is wrong with you, son? He asked. Why would you even think about cheating on Karis? Dad, I promise you I've never, ever cheated on her. I've never even thought about it. And I resent you automatically taking her side without even talking to me, I said. My dad knew that I would never lie to him. Not after that one time when I was just a child. He could always tell when I had messed up just by looking at my face. Maybe that's what made him back down, or maybe it was my tone of voice. Okay, he said. I just needed to see your response for myself. I believe you. I couldn't believe it when Karis told me, so I had to confront you face to face. I hope you understand, and I'm sorry. I understand, I said. I don't know why she would accuse me of this. She's never said anything, and she never gave me any indication that something is wrong. I don't understand it either. Something about this just doesn't add up. Anyway, I've retained an attorney. He's the best there is, and he should be here any time. I haven't said anything to your mom yet. I wanted to get your response first, he said. Thanks, Dad, I appreciate that. About that time, a tall, well-built man entered the reception room and walked up to my dad. Cor Condrake, good to see you again, he said. Yes, it's been too long, my father said in response. If you don't mind, I'd like to speak with your son privately first. The prosecutor will also want to interview him. Once I know what we're facing, I'll be in touch, okay? My father agreed, shook his hand, and started out. Don't worry, son, he said before he left. We'll get to the bottom of this. The lawyer sat down across from me and introduced himself as he opened his case. Michael Dax, he said, offering his hand. I did my best to return the shake, but it was difficult with the restraints. Before we get started, Jer, 
I'd like to do a quick polygraph if you don't mind. This isn't anything admissible in court, but it will give me an indication of your guilt or innocence. I'm not presuming anything, but I do want to know whether or not I'm representing a guilty person. Please take no offense. This is just for my own peace of mind, he said, pulling out a small box with wires attached to it. No offense taken, mister. Dax, I said. What do I have to do? You can start by calling me Michael, please, he said. Let's put these on your fingers, and once that's done, I'll ask you a few questions. After placing the probes on my fingers, he turned on his tablet, connected the box, and turned it on. Are you ready, he asked. I nodded to indicate I was ready. Just a few questions to set a baseline, okay, he asked. Is your name Jer Kondrake? Yes. Are you married to Karis Kondrake? Yes. Have you been on Earth for the last three years? Yes. At any time since becoming exclusive with Karis, have you ever had any feelings of affection towards anyone else? No. This time I want you to lie so I can compare the reaction, okay? He asked. Okay. Are you a native Terran? Yes, I said, lying on purpose. Okay, that's all I need, he said. From this short test, I believe you may very well be innocent. Thank you for being so truthful. You're welcome, I said. He disconnected the box and the wires and put them back into his briefcase. He closed his briefcase and looked at me, somewhat sad. I don't need to tell you that you're facing serious charges, he said. I haven't seen the charging documents yet, but I expect they'll be ready any time now. The prosecutor will want to speak with you, of course. This is very important. Under no circumstances are you to speak with him or anyone else without me there. At no time are you to speak to the media. If they approach you, direct them to me. If you have any issues in here, you contact me immediately, got it? Got it, I said. Tell me, did your wife ever indicate there was a problem? He asked. No, she never did. I don't know where this comes from. I haven't done anything wrong, I said. I felt so lost. Why would she do this to me? I wondered. I know you're scared right now. You're hurt, scared, confused. You're probably wondering why your wife would do this. I get it. But I need for you to be strong, okay? We'll get through this, together. Are you with me? Yeah, but it's not easy, I said. He patted my arm. It'll be okay, son. I'll be here with you, he said. Now, let's see what the prosecutor has to say. A couple minutes later, two guards came into the room and escorted us into a smaller interrogation room. A man I presumed was the prosecuting attorney was already there with a stack of documents. He glanced up as we were escorted in. The guard restrained me to a chair, then left, closing the door. Mikkel sat down next to me. So, Masol, I see you're defending cheaters now, he said sarcastically. My client hasn't been found guilty of anything, Don, he said. He hasn't even had a trial yet. He's presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Or did you forget that part of our judicial system? Normally, you'd be right, Don said. Except this is a capital adultery case, and the plaintiff has requested it be fast-tracked. Michael looked shocked. Aren't we jumping the gun here a bit? He asked. There hasn't even been any discovery. My client has a right to examine the evidence, and so far there's been nothing. The plaintiff, one Karis Kondrake, says your client has had multiple romantic involvements with as many as four individuals. She also says your client passed on a horrific contagious illness requiring extensive medical treatment. And she says your client is the father of at least one illegitimate child, Don said. That's a pack of lies, I said, nearly screaming. She's lying so much. I've never, ever been romantically involved with anyone but her since the day we became exclusive. Don tossed a folder on the table and Michael picked it up. He opened it and took out three photos, placing them on the table before me. There were also several other documents in the folder that looked like statements. These photos are fake, I said. They're obvious forgeries. Where did you get them? Your wife provided them to me, Don said. She also has video evidence. Michael held up his hand to keep me from saying anything else. Don, I'd like to discuss all this with my client for a few minutes before we proceed, if that's okay with you, he said. I think that would be very wise given what your client is facing, Don said, pulling out another folder and handing it to Michal. Here's your copy of the charging documents, the request for fast tracking, and the plaintiff's request for punishment. I'll gather my things here and step outside so you can confer with your client. Let me know when you're finished. After Don left, Miko reviewed all the documents and looked at the video, which was, at best, horrible and poorly made. I'm confused, Mashal. What's this about fast tracking and punishment requests? 
What's going on? I asked. He held up his hand as he pulled his phone out of his jacket. Hang on a second, okay? He asked, hitting a button on his phone. Jans, hi. This is McCall. Listen, I have a rush job that needs to get done right now. I need you to contact the Earth Rehabilitation Project office and get me all records, work requests, what, and activity logs for both Jerry and Karis Kondrake. I need to know every step they've taken on Earth for the last three years. Got it? Good. This is an emergency, so I need that information compiled and on my desk ASAP. We'll also need the best audiovisual people available immediately. Thanks. After closing the phone, Mikkel turned to me. This is worse than I thought. You've been charged with multiple counts of serious adultery, which under certain circumstances can carry severe consequences. Your wife has requested it be fast-tracked, which means we have one week to prove your innocence beyond a doubt. Normally, our system says a person is innocent until proven guilty, but there are times when the evidence makes it a clear-cut case, like if someone is caught in the act of a serious crime. In those cases, the court has said the perpetrator is essentially guilty and to save time and resources, is presumed guilty. The punishment request is a courtesy extended to the victim of the crime. In cases like this, the victim is given a choice regarding how the guilty party is to be, well, dealt with. It seems your wife wants to see you suffer because she requested a severe punishment. She wants you to publicly make amends and undergo significant rehabilitation. Worse yet, the prosecutor's office has approved it. At that moment, I felt like my world was crashing down around me and I fought a strong desire to pass out. The founders, apparently expressing a rather vicious streak, thought execution by wild animals would be the ultimate deterrent to crime. It had been done a few times and was considered extremely cruel. But that wasn't enough for my deceitful wife, who also requested I be publicly punished for something I never did before being devoured alive. McCall also explained to me that all of my assets would be taken away and given to her in order to supposedly make up for what I had allegedly done to her. I began crying hysterically and it took Michael some time to calm me down enough to understand what he was trying to tell me. Jer, please, let's get to work, he said. I didn't say this would be easy. I need you to look at these photos and these documents. I collected myself as best I could and looked at the photos. There were three of them, all of which were obvious fakes. Whoever put them together apparently didn't even have an elementary concept of photo editing. Even an untrained first grader could tell they had been faked. These are obvious fakes, done by someone who doesn't even know how to edit a photo I told my call. He readily agreed. The affidavits were also obvious fakes, printed from what appeared to be old Earth devices. I not only didn't recognize the names on the documents, but didn't even recognize the names of the cities listed. We also looked at the video, which looked like one of those grainy animated pictures popular during the 21st century. The quality, at best, was horrible. This was clearly faked and Michael assured me his specialists would sort it out. Okay, Jer, we're not done. I know this is hard, but hear me out. There is a way we can prove your innocence beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it could be dangerous, he said. I looked at him. At this point, I figured what could be more dangerous than being consumed by a bunch of ferocious creatures. What missile, please, I'll do anything. I said through my tears. Are you familiar with something called a memory search? He asked. I wasn't, and told him as much. It's fairly new, and has only been accepted by the courts in the last couple of years, so I'm not surprised you haven't heard of it. It's a technique that allows us to search and record your memories. Since this is her word against yours and the state is taking her side, it's the only certain way we have of proving your innocence. But there's a caveat. Actually, a couple of caveats. First, the procedure could cause brain damage. It's a slight risk, but a risk nevertheless and about 1% of those who went through the procedure have died from the complications. The second drawback is that if the search shows evidence of any criminal activity outside the scope of the initial search, the state has the right to pursue charges. So, above, I need to know. Have you engaged in any illegal activity at all since you became exclusive with Karis? No, none whatsoever, I said. My parents raised me to obey the law. Good, McCall said. Second, have you found yourself in any compromising situations like getting too intoxicated at a party or something like that? No, I said. I don't drink, and the only time I ever go to a party is if I take my wife out on a date. Okay, Michael said. I'll get the search request in when Don comes back. He has no reason to deny it, and if he does then, I'll file for a mistrial and demand all charges be dropped. 
One final thing, and I want you to cling to, to this. There's a clause in the penal code that's only been invoked maybe three times in the last 150 years. It was put in to prevent this very thing from happening. It's called the Retribution Act, and it was inserted 200 years ago. It basically says that if an accused person is found innocent and was prosecuted due to the malicious actions by the accuser, then the accuser suffers the fate that was to be handed out to the accused. You mean if I'm found innocent, then Karis gets the punishment she wanted for me? I asked. Yes, that's exactly what I mean, Michael said. Along with any conspirator she may have been working with. I thought about it for a moment. I loved that woman exclusively for the last seven years. Went to Earth because she thought it would be good for us. Gave her everything I could. Now she wanted to falsely accuse me and use the state to harm me just so she could get my assets. Forget her, I thought. Do it, I said. Expose her. You got it. Just don't let her know, though Michael said. I smiled. Finally, I had power over her and she didn't even know it yet. Masol got up and let Don back in the room. So, have you two decided what you're going to do? He asked. Yes, we have, Michael said. Good, Don said, smiling. Now, if your client will just sign this affidavit acknowledging his guilt, maybe I can persuade Mrs. Condrake to go a bit easy, perhaps changing the punishment to something more humane, like molecular transformation or vaporization. No, Don, that won't do at all, Michael said. In fact, I want a memory search and retrieval procedure on my client as soon as possible, like today. I know you have the form there on your tablet and you can make it happen while we're here. If you refuse my request, then I'm prepared to file motion for immediate dismissal and I'll follow that up with a very expensive and public lawsuit. Don seemed to have deflated a bit after that statement and acquiesced. Very well, Mashal, I'll do it now and we'll get your client's memories searched immediately. I had hoped your client could see his way to saving the state some money and resolving this quickly, but apparently that's not going to be the case. Too bad, really, Don said. My client's life is not something to be resolved so easily, Don Michael said. Of course not, Don replied. Do what you have to. There, your client is scheduled to report to the state hospital in three hours for his procedure. I've given you and his parents clearance to be with him the whole time. I hope that settles any concern you may have regarding potential prosecutorial misconduct. For the moment, McCall said, While you're at it, make sure to keep Mrs. Condrake away from my client while he is in the hospital, if you would. Consider it done, Don said, filling out the restraining order on his tablet. He hit enter before looking back at Mashal and Jair. Well, I take it then we're still on for one week from today, Don said. And Mr. Condrake, I sincerely hope you take these last few days you have to find peace with whatever higher power you may believe in. I'm really not a vindictive man, but I do have a duty to perform for the state. I was about to tell Don that at the moment, I was more than vindictive and to go away with his duty, but Michael gave me a look that seemed to say, shut up. So I said nothing. The guard came to escort us after Don left and informed me that I had another visitor. Michael asked who it was. It's Mrs. Condrake, is that okay? The guard asked. Only if I can be present during the visitation, Michael said. Suit yourself, the guard said. We made it back to the visitation room where Karis sat, waiting for me. Michael hung back, but was still able to hear and witness the entire visit. She looked good, but then again she always did. I noticed she was wearing a knee-length wraparound dress, her favorite beach cover-up. I couldn't help but wonder who she would be with. Karis, I said. Looks like you're headed to the beach. Looking to have some fun while waiting for my punishment. She at least had the good sense to look a bit embarrassed. Yes, I'm going to Westmoreland. I thought I might soak up some sun, she said. Who's he? She asked, looking at Masal. Oh, him, I said. He's helping me with some of my final arrangements. That's probably why, she said. So what can I do for you? I asked, especially since you're determined to have me unjustly punished in such a cruel way. You do know those pictures and video you gave to the state are obvious forgeries. Same with those alleged affidavits. I can't believe you'd stoop to that. Tell me, please, especially since I only have a week to live, who is he? It doesn't matter if they're fake or not, she said. You'll never be able to prove your innocence, and that's all that matters. And by the way, my father said he's bringing in a fresh batch of very hungry creatures just for your last public performance, she said. Yes, I know your father is the provincial justice minister, Karis, I said. Does he know what you've been planning? Who do you think helped set this all up? Who better than the justice minister to help make it happen, she asked. 
He's also made sure that Rondal and I will have a front row seat reserved for your punishment, and we plan on enjoying it to the fullest. Then we'll maybe take a long cruise and enjoy ourselves on your dime, of course. So you're doing all this just to mess with that sleazeball Rondal Kalrishan? I asked. You are being so naive, you know that? She asked. Of course. And anyone else I feel like messing with. Who do you think kept me company at night while you were out helping rehabilitate Earth's information grid? His courage isn't quite as strong as yours, but his confidence is absolutely remarkable, and I love spending time with him. And please don't worry about my well-being. Rondell plans to take good care of me this week. See? She asked, revealing her tattoo. I noticed an R tattooed on her skin. I couldn't help but smile. Karis had no idea what she had just done to herself, Rondal, and her father. No hard feelings, okay? She asked. You have no idea what I'm feeling right now, Karis, I said. Please, enjoy yourself. And tell Rondal to do the same. I'll see you in court. Karis's smile vanished. My last statement had obviously confused her, and for a moment, I thought I saw guilt on her face. That didn't last long, though. Goodbye, Jir, she said. I'm sorry about all this. You have no idea, I told her. Go on, get out of here. After Karis left, the guards took Mikol and me to the hospital where I was prepped for my memory search. Electrodes were placed strategically on my head, and a nurse began an IV to keep me stable during the thorough procedure. I was warned that I could experience a severe headache upon waking up, but that turned out to be an understatement. After being connected to what looked like several banks of equipment-laden carts, a technician ran what I presumed were tests to make sure everything was properly set up and functioning. He walked over to me and gave me a final brief. Mr. Condrake. He said, everything appears to be ready for the scan. Just so you know, we're only going to scan the last seven years of memories, and that could take a while. You will wake up with a headache, but we'll give you something to alleviate that. Additionally, then, we'll keep you here for a couple of days for observation just to be safe. I've already informed your lawyer that the scan will be saved, archived, and protected from outside meddling. We should have the full results of the scan within 24 hours. Do you have any questions for me at this time? No. I said, let's just get this done. A nurse came and injected the drug to help me sleep. Within seconds, I was out. I was told the entire scan took nearly eight hours, but from my perspective, almost no time elapsed at all. One second I was falling asleep, and the next I was waking up with a splitting headache. A nurse injected a painkiller into my IV, and the pain began to subside. Michael was at my bedside along with my parents. Good, you're awake, Michael said. The scan went very well and appears to have been a success. I'm going over to supervise and observe the analysis, and I'll be in touch. You get some rest now, okay? I simply nodded as my head still hurt too much to move, despite the painkiller. My parents looked at me with tears in their eyes. Son, Michael told us what Kara said today. I can't believe she actually did this. I'm so sorry I ever doubted you, my dad said. Just know that we're with you on this 100%. She and her father, along with that Rondell character, deserve whatever happens to them. Thanks, dad, I said. My mother hugged me close, and I could feel her tears. Just know that we love you and we believe you, she said. I nodded my thanks. It still hurt to talk. We'll be right down the hall, okay? You just get some sleep, my dad said. I tried, but my sleep was plagued with nightmares, all of them involving my wife. They started nice enough, with images of my bride, happy, smiling, offering herself to me. Then she transformed, the R. Tattoo appearing above her tummy, her face becoming twisted and evil before turning into an image of a terrifying creature with rows of razor-sharp teeth, preparing to devour me whole. I awoke with a start, my body covered in sweat. I tried going back to sleep after calming down a bit, but the nightmarish images kept haunting me. Needless to say, I didn't get much rest. I begged for relief, but none came. The staff all knew why I was there, and while they were professional and courteous, none were friendly. I told one nurse about my nightmares and asked for something to help me sleep, but she politely declined. Given what you're facing, I'm not surprised you're having nightmares, she said. Try to think of something else, maybe a pleasant childhood memory. But you don't understand, I said. I'm innocent. I'm being framed. What you're going through is normal, she said in a patronizing tone of voice. It's best if you just accept your fate and move on. Damn it, I'm not accepting anything. Now do something or I'll have my lawyer take action, I demanded. Mr. Condrake, if you don't settle down, I'll have to restrain you further. Please. 
I don't want to have to place you in stasis for the rest of the week, but I will if you persist in these delusions, she said firmly. I stayed quiet, resigned to the idea that I would get no rest, at least for the remainder of my time there. Finally, McCull came back into the room. My goodness, he said. You look horrible. Have you gotten any sleep at all? Not much, I said. I told him about my recurring nightmares and the staff's refusal to take action. He patted my arm. Don't worry, I'll speak with them and get this taken care of, he said. I just wanted you to know that the analysis of your scan is complete. It's been verified, certified, and filed with the court. As I suspected, there's no memory of any illegal activity whatsoever, and certainly no wrongdoing on your part over the last seven years. The court really has no choice but to declare you innocent of all charges. So that's it, then right? I asked. Not quite, he said. I've got a team working on your case right now, and they've been working nonstop. There are a lot of unanswered questions. We obtained the dispatch records from the rehab project, and from what we can tell, you were nowhere near the places mentioned in those affidavits that were filed. Tell me, did you and your wife work together much while you were on Earth? No, I said. She was kept in the Los Angeles area, working on the local medical facilities, while I was sent all over the planet supervising installations. Do you know if your wife worked with Rondell while you were on Earth? He asked. I know they were in the same area most of the time. I didn't see her that much, maybe once or twice a month, sometimes even longer, but I was usually traveling most of the time. I saw him even less. I don't know how close they worked, and we never really discussed it, I said. Interesting, Michael said. It turns out Rondell was working in the archive area. Were you aware of that? Again, I have to say no. We didn't discuss our work much. Why? I asked. Well, we tried to locate the people mentioned in the affidavits your wife filed to verify their claims, but we weren't able to find them. Then we did a search on the thumbprints used on the affidavits themselves. Guess what? In every case, the thumbprint belonged to a deceased person. One was over 450 years old. And guess who was working in the graves registration project? Rondell? I asked. That's right, he said. And guess who was directly responsible for getting those affidavits to the prosecuting attorney's office? Your wife's father, the provincial justice minister. Trust me, that never happens, he said. So you think Kara's father is part of this conspiracy? I asked. Absolutely, Michael said. Given what your wife said yesterday, it all makes sense. Now, let me go talk to the medical staff and you try to get some rest. A few minutes later, the nurse entered the room with a man I presumed was her superior. Mr. Condrake, he said, I want to apologize to you for the treatment you've received. We're here to alleviate pain and suffering, not perpetuate it, and I assure you that you will get the relief you need. Again, I apologize, he looked at the nurse, who seemed somewhat embarrassed. She came to my side and pressed something against my forehead. I'm setting you up with a brainwave generator to help you sleep and take the nightmares away, Mr. Condrake. And I sincerely apologize for my attitude earlier. Please forgive me, she said. I accepted her apology as she pressed a button on the wave generator on my forehead. Within minutes, then I was getting drowsy and soon fell asleep. I awoke after eight hours of the best sleep I had had in some time. The guards came in to inform me that I was being moved back to the detention center. Fortunately, they allowed me to keep the brainwave generator, and, and a nurse showed me how to properly use it. The next few days flew by for me. My parents visited me on a daily basis to keep my spirits up, and Michael came by every day to update me on the case and prepare me for my court appearance. It was clear that my wife had been planning this for some time with her father and her lover. By the time of my court appearance, I felt more than prepared for what was to happen. On the day of my court appearance, the guards gave me a hearty breakfast, allowed me to take a long shower, and even gave me extra time to get dressed in a well-tailored suit my parents had brought for me. In their view, today was to be my last day alive, so I was given some leeway. Michael and my parents accompanied me to the justice building. We were escorted to the courtroom and directed to our table. The prosecutor was already at his table with my wife, Rondell, and her father sitting in the first row behind the prosecutor. They each looked at me with a sly smile, confident that today would be my last day. The media was also present, given the fact that my wife's father, the top justice official in our province, was in the audience. No doubt they were all hoping for a dramatic end to the day's proceedings. The judge entered the courtroom, and the bailiff ordered everyone to rise. We did, and took our seats after the judge sat down. Are both parties prepared to present their facts in the case of the state versus Jer Condrake? The judge asked. 
The state is ready, the prosecutor said. The defense is ready, Michael added. Very well. How does the defense plead? The judge asked. Michael stood up. The defendant maintains his complete innocence. Your honor, he said. Understood. The state may present its case, the judge said. Don stood up and faced the judge. You honor, the state has provided evidence showing that the defendant, Jir Kondrake, has engaged in multiple counts of betrayal against his wife over the last three years, and in the process, has harmed his poor suffering wife with the disease. Additionally, he has fathered a child with another woman in the process, and we believe he has plans to continue in his illicit and wrongful activity upon returning to Earth. The evidence has been provided to the court, and it is up to the defendant to prove his innocence beyond a shadow of a doubt. Given the seriousness of the charge, Mrs. Condrake, the injured party, requests an immediate judgment and asks that disposal be carried out at once, Don said, before sitting down. The judge looked over the paperwork before him prior to saying anything further. Given that the injured party seeks Mr. Condrake's punishment by exile, I'd like to hear what he has to say before we execute him, if that's all right by you, he said, addressing the prosecutor. As you wish, your honor, but the state requests the order be issued expeditiously, Don said. Please remain respectful, is the judge said. Don nodded his head and sat down. The judge looked at Mashal. What evidence does the defense have to present? The judge asked. Michael stood up. Your Honor, the defense has undeniable evidence that not only shows the defendant's innocence of all charges, but also shows that the defendant is the target of a horrible plot to use the judicial system to harm him and legally steal all of his assets in order to continue misses. Kondrake's wrongful and highly illegal affairs, Michael said. The judge's eyes widened at Michael's comments. The courtroom murmured in surprise and Karis looked nervously at Rondal and her father. Present your evidence, please, the judge said. To start, your honor, but the defense would like to call expert witnesses to explain the alleged evidence presented by the state. Please do, the judge said. The defense calls Lars Larson to the stand. Please, Michael said. A tall man in his early thirties approached the witness stand. The bailiff made him swear an oath to tell the truth before he took the stand. Michael approached him. Mr. Larson, you are one of the state's foremost authorities on audio-video evidence, are you not? He asked. Yes, sir, I am Lars said. Michael handed him copies of the pictures used by the prosecution. You've had a chance to thoroughly inspect the photographs provided by the state, along with the original source files? Yes, sir, I have Lars answered. And what is your conclusion after examining this so-called evidence? These files are clear forgeries. Worse yet, they appear to have been crudely manipulated to make it appear as though the defendant is engaging in inappropriate behavior, Lars said. What led you to that conclusion? Michael asked. The original picture files were created with an encoding scheme that has not been used for well over three centuries, Lars said. After performing a deep dive of Earth's ancient internet archives, we were able to find the exact photos that were used to create these forgeries. Were you also able to determine who may have accessed these files? Michael asked. The system log indicated they were accessed by an individual with the restoration team, Lars said. And were you able to identify who that individual may have been? We were, Lars said. Can you please state the name of that person? The credentials used belong to a Rondel Coalition. Lars said. Gasps were heard in the courtroom as Rondel looked around nervously. Thank you, Michael said. Did you also have an opportunity to examine the video provided by the state as well? Michael asked. We did, Lars said. What was your conclusion? The video file wasn't forged, but we were able to find the file in the same internet archive Lars said. And? Michael asked. The original video also dates back to the ancient Earth internet archives, Lars said. So, in your professional opinion, this video could not have been taken any time in the last three years, Michael said. This video could not have been taken in the last 300 years, Lars said. Were you able to identify the user who downloaded it? Michael asked. Yes, Lars said. It was downloaded by Rondel Colrissian about the same time as the photos were accessed. Thank you, Mitchell said. Finally, did you have an opportunity to examine the alleged affidavits provided by the state? Yes, we did. What did you conclude after examining those documents? Michael asked. The documents themselves were created using century-old Earth technology. We were unable to locate the individuals named on the documents, but we discovered an anomaly with the identifying thumbprints, Lars said. Please explain, Michael said. In every case, the thumbprint was of an individual who had been dead for many years. One document, for example, 
has the print of an individual who died in Seattle in 2018, Lars said. So you're saying these affidavits could not possibly have been made by anyone living in the last three years. Is that correct? That is correct, Lars said. Thank you. That is all Michael said. Your witness, Michael, said to Don, no questions at this time, Don said. The defense calls Abel Cain to the stand, please, Michael said. The judge agreed, and another man approached the witness stand. He sat down after swearing to tell the truth. Mr. Cain, can you please tell the court your current position? Michael asked. Yes, sir. I am currently the senior system administrator responsible for the server farm used to handle memory searches, he said. Michael handed him a sheet of paper with rows and columns of information. Mr. Cain, can you please identify the paper I just handed you? Michael asked. Yes, sir. It's a portion of the main server access log file, Abel said. Please direct your attention to the rows highlighted in yellow, Michael said. Can you please tell the court what those rows indicate? They tell me someone attempted to access and delete a memory search file, Abel said. Which memory search file was that? Michael asked. The file corresponds to a search conducted on the defendant, Jir Kondrake. Was the attempt to delete the file successful? Michael asked. No, sir. It was not, Abel said. Can you explain why it wasn't successful, Michael asked. Yes. Our system is designed so that only two people can remove files. I am one of the two individuals with that right. However, I should add that even if the file was successfully deleted off this server, it would not have been deleted from the system due to multiple redundant servers and ongoing backups, he said. I see, Michael said. Can you identify the individual who attempted to delete the file? Yes, I can. And whom might that individual be? Michael asked. Justice Minister Court LeDonc Abel said. The courtroom erupted in more gasps, prompting the judge to pound his gavel. The minister's face became pale as his name was mentioned. Can you offer any possible explanation as to why the provincial justice minister might want to delete that file? Michael asked. Don instantly rose to object. Objection, your honor. That calls for speculation, he said. Sustained, the judge said. That's all the questions I have for this witness, Michael said. Your witness, he said to Don. No questions at this time, Don responded. The defense calls Justice Minister Court LeDonc, Michal said. Court hesitated at first but took the stand after the judge motioned for him to do so. He swore to tell the truth and took his seat. Minister LeDonc, you are Mrs. Kondraki's father, are you not, Michael asked. I am, Court said. Did you or did you not attempt to delete the memory search file corresponding to the defendant? He asked. I don't recall, Court said. Minister, may I please remind you that you are under oath and perjury is a serious matter, Michael said. Court became indignant. Of course I know that perjury is a serious matter, he said. I perform many mundane tasks during my workday and I simply don't recall accessing that file, that's all. Okay, Minister. Let's try something a bit easier. Did you or did you not assist your daughter in her effort to bring these allegations forward? I may have made a call or two, Court said. Did you or did you not order fresh mukla for the planned execution of the defendant? Michael asked. I signed so many papers. I don't remember everything, Court said. It's possible. Let me show you a piece of video, Minister. Maybe this will jog your memory, Michael said. He motioned to the court audio video tech, who played video of Kara's detention center visit so the entire court could hear and see her statements. Well, Minister? Michael asked. Okay, so maybe I did help fast-track Karis complaint a bit, Court said. Of course. I understand she's your daughter and you only want the best for her, right? Yes, Court said. Tell us, Minister, how would you describe your relationship with your daughter, Michael asked. Objection, Don yelled. Immaterial. Michael turned to the judge. Your Honor, if you will bear with me, please. This is extremely important to our case, Michael said. Very well, Counselor. Make your point, the judge said. Michael motioned to the audio video tech who started another video. The courtroom erupted again. Order in the court. The judge said loudly. Michael motioned to pause the video. Minister, can you please identify the three individuals in this freeze frame? He asked. Yes, court said. And? Who are they? Michael asked. Myself, my daughter Karis and Rondal Kolrishing court said. Please tell the court when and where was this taken? Michael asked. Keep in mind it is time-stamped. This week at Westmoreland Beach Court said, I felt like I was about to throw up watching my wife debase herself like a common puppet with both Rondol and her father. What they said afterward was even worse. Just think Karis said in the video. 
In less than a week, this will be able to do this every day, all day long, and we won't even have to sneak around anymore. They all laughed at that. Don't worry, daughter dearest. I'll personally see to that, Court said. I heard he had a memory wiped on Karis said. Is there any way we can get rid of that or do something with it? I'm the Justice Minister, Court said. I'll go in and delete it. Don't worry. Michael gave the signal to stop the video. One could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. Karis and Rondell held their heads down and covered their eyes as though that would somehow keep the media from seeing them. Would you care to revise your statement, Minister? Or do you wish to be charged with perjury, along with incest and the other charges you'll be facing today? Michael asked. No comment at this time as I refuse to give an answer that might incriminate myself, Court said. Michael shook his head in disbelief. Justice Minister, he said sarcastically. I'm done with this. Witness, Michael said. I have no questions at this time, Your Honor, Don said. Michael pulled out another tablet and handed it to the bailiff who relayed it on to the judge. And finally, Your Honor, this is the result of an intense memory search of the defendant going back over the last seven years, the entire time of his exclusive relationship with Mrs. Condrake. As Your Honor can see by the summary on page one, signed and verified by the Justice Ministry, but Mr. Condrake has engaged in absolutely no conduct that could be considered illegal by the state, including adultery, he said. Since there was no adultery on the part of the defendant, there is no way he could have impregnated another woman in the last three years, nor is there any way he could have passed on a transmitted disease to his wife. In light of this evidence, Your Honor, I move that my client be immediately judged innocent and all charges summarily dropped, Michael said, as the judge looked over the summary. I have to agree, Counselor, he said. Will Defendant Jir Kondraki please rise? I stood up next to my lawyer. The judge looked long and hard at me. Mr. Kondrake, it is the judgment of this court that you have been found innocent of all charges put forward against you. Please accept the apologies of the court. Michael spoke out. Your Honor, my client hereby invokes his rights under the Retribution Act, he said. Objection, Don yelled. This is highly irregular, Your Honor. The Retribution Act hasn't been invoked in years. The judge looked hard at the prosecutor. You know the Retribution Act was put in place to prevent exactly this kind of prosecutorial malfeasance, counselor. The things I have seen and heard today frankly make me sick to my stomach, the judge said. You should consider yourself lucky that I'm not going to toss you into Mukla tank with the three individuals behind you. I will, however, see to it that the Judicial Review Board take a hard look at your total incompetence in this matter. As for the co-conspirators in this attempt to commit murder through the court, you are hereby sentenced to death by the same method you chose for Mr. Condrake. My wife, Rondell, and Court looked like they were going to be sick. Their faces went pale and their eyes were as big as saucers. However, the judge said, I am concerned about the possibility this conspiracy may be wider than the three of you. Therefore, I am ordering you to be taken from this court for an immediate memory scan. Once I have reviewed the results of those scans, I will make my final determination as to your disposal. Guards, take them away, the judge ordered. As the four guards approached my wife and her co-conspirators, Cord and Rondell looked at each other, nodded their heads, then jumped forward and tried to grab one guard's sidearm. The other three guards reacted quickly, pulled their sidearms and fired multiple times, the plasma projectiles going clean through both men, sending them to the floor in bloody heaps. Please don't shoot me, Karis cried, holding up her hands in surrender. The guards quickly grabbed her and secured her hands behind her back. She looked at me as she was being led out. Please, Jer, I don't want to die. Have mercy on me, she begged through her tears. Like you are going to have mercy on me, I asked. Not hardly. The judge banged his gavel and declared order in the court. He looked at me before speaking again. Mr. Condrake, I strongly suggest you get counseling to help you deal with the events of this past week. Again, you have my most sincere apologies, he said. I will, your honor. Thank you, I said. Mr. Dax, the judge said, please join me in my chambers after you've finished with your client. Yes, your honor, he said. Michael shook my hand in congratulations, but he looked sad. I'm glad we won, of course, Jer, but I'm truly sorry for what it cost you. I'll call the medical facility to let them know you're coming after you check out of detention. Maybe your folks can take you over there, he said. I'll come by and check in on you, thanks, Miss All. I couldn't have gotten through this without you, I said. He was right. I had won my case and proved my innocence. That, but at what cost? 
My marriage was completely destroyed and my trust in basic humanity was all but gone. I would get my revenge, but I wondered if I would be able to live with myself in the long run. I had a lot to think about before I could go on with the rest of my life. The guards escorted my parents and I out of the courtroom and to the parking area through a corridor not accessible by the media, which was fortunate. The last thing any of us wanted to deal with was a bunch of snarky reporters. We went first to the detention center where I was checked out and my belongings returned to me. The guards at the center treated me kindly, having watched the entire debacle unfold on their info screens in real time. From there we went to the medical facility where I was checked in and taken to a nicely appointed private room. I collapsed in a reclining chair, mentally exhausted by what had taken place. My parents came over after talking with what I presumed would be my counselor. You get some rest, son, my dad said. You've been through a lot, and I want you to know I'm proud of the way you handled yourself. I'm proud of you too, Jir, my mother said, giving me one of her world-class hugs. Suddenly, I broke down crying. My mother hugged me even tighter. It's all right, Jir, she said. It's over now. You're safe. No one's going to hurt you. I eventually calmed down and noticed an attractive woman about Kara's age standing over us when I looked up. Your mother's right, Jir, she said calmly. You're safe and I'm here to help get you over it. I see you've taken a good first step. It's important that you deal with your grief as soon as possible. The counselor, who introduced herself as Shear, spoke briefly with my parents, then came back to me. Your parents are going home for now, but they'll be back soon, she said. You're very lucky to have such loving parents, you know. She sat down in front of me and took my hand. I began to instantly feel better. Now, tell me about your life with Kara, she said. I told her the story of how we got together in school, the years of dating, and what I thought had been a good marriage. We took the six-year assignment to Earth so we could come back and start our family, I said. We figured that with our combined earnings we could buy a house overlooking Westmoreland Beach and raise our kids. Guess that's not going to happen now. I don't understand how she could have done this. What did I do wrong? What made her hate me so much that she'd do this to me? I don't know. Jer, she said. Maybe something happened when you two were on Earth. You said that you guys were apart more than you were together. Maybe she lost it during those separations. It's happened before, you know. But she knew we'd be apart for most of the tour, I said. That's why we took this vacation to reconnect with each other. She's going through a memory search now, Cheer said. Maybe then you'll get your questions answered. Yeah, maybe I said. Look, you've had a rough day, Cher said. Why don't you get some rest and we can talk more later, okay? Sure, I said. Cher excused herself and left the room. I changed into my pajamas and got into bed, quickly falling asleep. I woke up hours later to the sound of my door alarm. I put on my robe and went to see who was there. It was Mashal. I opened the door to let him in, with Cher right behind him. Well, it looks like you're being well taken care of, Michael said, smiling. I have some news for you. What is it, I asked. The memory search on Karis is complete, he said. Unfortunately, she didn't handle it well. What happened? It turns out she had a serious brain condition that couldn't be treated in time. She passed away, Jer, he said. I wasn't too upset about her death, but I was relieved that I wouldn't have to face her anymore. I nodded, understanding the situation. So what did you find out? I asked. Her scan showed a lot of concerning things, Jer. It turns out that your wife had been unfaithful to you while you were on Earth, and she had a complicated relationship with her father since she was young. There's more to it, but I haven't had the chance to go through everything. However, as far as the legal side goes, the case is pretty much closed now that she's gone. All that's left is sorting out the assets, and my team is already working on that. With the combined assets from your wife, her father, and Rondel, it seems like you'll be set for life. For now, you'll be taken care of by my daughter, Cher, who is not only available, but also actively looking for someone he said, giving Cher a playful nudge. Cher laughed and slapped his arm. So you better make sure to behave, young man, he added, winking. You wouldn't want to upset the next justice minister, would you? What? I asked. You're going to take court's job? Yes, that's what the judge wanted to discuss with me after your trial. It turns out he's on the advisory board for the justice ministry, and he offered me the position until the next election. The board still needs to approve it, but it's just a formality, he explained. Congratulations, I said. Thanks, but I'm not done with your case yet, so we'll be in touch. And don't worry about the bill. The state has to cover all the legal costs and fees since they failed in their prosecution, he assured. So get some rest, take care of yourself, 
and we'll talk soon, all right? He asked. I thanked him for everything he had done and shook his hand before he left. Over the next few days, Cher filled me in on all the details of Karis' infidelity. From the memory scan, we discovered that Karis had contracted a serious and life-threatening illness on Earth. It was a severe form of illness that could be fatal within days. Of course, I hadn't caught it from her. It turned out that she had engaged in multiple relationships with other people while I was working on fixing the planet's information infrastructure. Luckily, she had received treatment before we got back together, so I hadn't contracted anything from her. She had also been involved with Rondel, but it was more about him being her father's sidekick than anything else. The other aspects of their relationship was simply a perk for helping me get framed. Her true love, it turned out, was her father, who saw me as an obstacle to their relationship. Cher spent several days exclusively with me, helping me work through the trust issues I now had and supporting me in overcoming my hesitation to be with another woman. After what Karis had done, I couldn't imagine putting myself in a situation where I could get hurt like that again. A week after the trial, Cher sat me down for a long conversation. The truth is she told me, people are still the same today as they were in the past. We all have desires, and those desires haven't changed just because we have advanced technology. Most of us want to be good and do the right thing, but there are some, like your ex-wife and her father, who don't care about that and will hurt anyone to get what they want. Jer, I've had the chance to spend the last week with you, and I know you're a good person who wants to do the right thing and maybe even have a family someday. I know this has been difficult for you, but not all of us are like Karis. The truth is, she continued, Dan I've gotten to know you pretty well these past few days, and I would love to show you what it's like to truly be loved by a good person. Would you allow me to do that? Wow, I thought. This was a counseling method I had never heard of before, but I was willing to explore the possibility. I looked at Cher and compared her to my best memory of Karis. That's when I realized something. I didn't have any truly good memories of my ex-wife. Sure, we had a good connection, but now all those memories were tainted by her actions and the things I learned from her own memories. I also realized that Karis was the first woman I had ever fallen in love with and been with. It made sense why I was feeling so messed up. You know, I've never been one for casual relationships, I confessed. I know, she said. Me neither. Cher was right, she had exactly what I needed. And it turned out, I had what she needed too. It just so happened that she had previously been in an unhealthy relationship with someone who treated her poorly, almost to the point of abuse. This is the point where my story began, but the tale was far from over. A few months later, we got married. Michael was right when he said I would be set for life after getting the assets from the three co-conspirators who tried to harm me. On top of that, the rehab project bought out the last three years of my contract and also paid me what was to have been given to Karis. Cher continued to work at the medical center until she got pregnant with our first child, a son we named Michael Kaur, in honor of our fathers. After that, she decided to be a full-time wife and mother. I continued to work as a part-time design consultant for the rehab project performing most of my duties from our custom-built home overlooking Westmoreland Beach. We selected the provincial justice minister with promises to reform the death penalty. At the top of his list was ending the century's old practice of punishing criminals in a harsh manner. There were a number of changes within the ministry, which included a full review of all cases handled by some of the prosecutors. A number of the attorneys, including Don, found themselves looking for work outside the government sector. Every so often, my thoughts would drift back to my past with Karis. Cher, being the understanding, loving beauty she is, could see it in my face and would put her best counseling practices to use until all I could think of was her warm, refreshing embrace around mine. After our third child, I found there was never any time left to dwell on the past. But there was plenty of time for me to think about my future with Cher, our three children, and the grandchildren they would bring into the world. And it was definitely a bright future.